flying into Nepal over the highest mountains in the world was only the beginning of our adventures. Operation Rally was returning to this wild and beautiful land and its capital, Kathmandu. This was to be an executive expedition, led by the world-famous explorer, Colonel John Blashford Snell. Tomorrow morning, uh, we shall set off from here at 7 o'clock by bus. Only a few of our group had taken part in expeditions before, and at this stage, they were feeling a bit apprehensive about what lay ahead. With us, we had a mixture of professional and business people, a police officer, a doctor, snake expert, management consultants, and me, amateur cameraman and manager from Marks and Spencer. We were heading through rugged terrain for a Taru village. After many hours of bumping along dirt roads, when only JBS managed to relax, we were greeted by the local people. In the evening, they welcomed us with a traditional dance. Soon, members of the group were on their feet taking part. Next morning we were on the road again, with each village another puncture away from Western civilization. Even here technology is helping the daily task of making flour. But we were soon confronted with a more ancient lifestyle, as women washed by the pool and a funeral procession made its way to the place of cremation. Porters from Tiger Mountain were assembling our supplies, for from now on we would be walking into the mountains and the upper reaches of the Canali River. Everything we would need on the next phase of the expedition had to be carried. Nepal is much more than a strip of land 500 miles long and 150 miles wide between India and Tibet. One writer has said that Nepal is there to change you, not for you to change it. Make your footprints with care and awareness of the precious balance around you. Nepal is not only a place on the map, but an experience, a way of life from which we can all learn. For the next few days, we trekked through the hill country, making camp where we could and sleeping under the stars. Our meals were simple affairs, 
with lots of curry, dal and chilli sauce. But not everyone ate a hearty breakfast this morning as we were about to set off on our rafts down the treacherous Karnali River. Our preparations were thorough. We knew our lives could depend on them. At first, the waters were smooth before we were plunged into the rapids. swept us in towards a rocky outcrop, but we managed to avoid disaster. It was an exhilarating experience, as well as a frightening one. The Canali eventually released us into calm waters again. Few could disguise their feelings of relief and a sense of achievement. From a high and shaky bridge, we could look down onto the river before crossing to meet the people of a local village, Jungligat. The villagers live a simple life, producing their own food. All follow the Hindu faith and seem content and happy with their lifestyle. Soon it was time to take to the river again. This was one of the quieter parts before another stretch of rough water. Because these rapids were so dangerous, we planned to float the rafts down with their loads of equipment while we followed along the bank. We used the ropes to guide the rafts and at first all worked well. This technique is called lining. Everything we possessed and needed for the days ahead was lashed on the rafts.
As the pig boat came down the river, the rope snagged and we were in trouble. One guide rope would need to be cut to release the raft, but the risk was that we might lose everything. Mark and Magali went into the water to help. It was a close call, but our raft and precious equipment were saved. Our reward was to glide through still waters between rock walls which rose like cathedrals of stone. I climbed to a high vantage point to watch the rafts traverse the last and most dangerous part of the rapids. At last we were through, thoroughly shaken and stirred by the experience. Every time we broke camp, we collected our rubbish into bags and burnt it, so as to leave the river and its banks unspoiled. This is the confluence of the Canali and Seti rivers. Here we came upon the Nepalese equivalent of an Irish pochine maker and were offered some of his brew, strong stuff. We also purchased our next meal, fresh on the hoof. By now, we were all in very high spirits, which showed at a night around the campfire. In the morning, from our jungle vantage point, we enjoyed the serenity of the scene by the river. The local girls, the elephant boys, and their charges all bathed together in the Peacock River. Okay, who wants, who wants to go here? 
We were now in the real jungle and would ride the elephants, which the Nepalese call Hati, as we explore the area. We had heard legends of mammoths in the area. And there they were. This was our first brief glimpse of them. They were massive, bigger than any Asian elephant we had ever seen. The local villagers had named them Jetta and Kancha. What strange looking beasts with their domed heads and thick bodies. No wonder the locals thought them to be mammoths. In camp, I spent much of my time looking after the domestic elephants. We kept a record of our daily sightings of animals and began our collection. It was our intention to study several species before, of course, releasing them again into the wild. I'm not sure of the name, I think we've just identified it. It's one of the water snakes. Not at all slippy, is it? No, quite dry. He seems quite happy, really. He's all right, yes, he was a bit stressed. Our camp was surrounded by wildlife of every kind. We found the footprints of one of the giant elephants close by and were able to calculate its size. Jetta. 11 foot 6 at the shoulder. We had to identify the many birds we sighted. Our camp offered all mod cons. Uh, 96 last year, all told. So 96 last year and 152 this year. So that if we get all the, the extra ones from last year, we're on the way to Dublin last year's total. And that's out, and that's out of how many? Um, 800 about 800, 850 something in Nepal. So hopefully we'll have a quarter. So we'll you have a quarter of all the birds in Nepal. Which time isn't bad when you consider a lot of them are on okay. One of the main purposes of the expedition was to take business executives out of their normal working situation and give them training in leadership skills in this outdoor classroom. Next day, we resumed our search and found Jetta and Kancha. We now believe that Jetta, the elephant with the longer tusks, was the biggest Asian elephant that had ever been seen. And this has now been confirmed, and his name has been changed to Raj Ghan, King Elephant. We had achieved the main aim of our expedition with this discovery, 
and these images went round the world on CNN News via satellite. elephants needed daily care. We crossed the river to look for snakes and Mark soon found a likely location. It's a common crite. One of, one of the most venomous, one of the top four killers in Asia. It's a baby one. These bite and sting. It's the same burrow. Well, we know he's in there. We don't lop his head off now. There's his head. It's all right. He's only cross, he's got poison. This is. He is lovely. One of the biggest snakes in Asia. After the pythons and the king cobra. <laughs> get a photo, get some photo. <laughs> Having wrestled with the snakes, Mark was keen to try a crocodile. As one group was briefed before going off alone, the local school worked away nearby under the trees. We therefore will leave you there sometime tomorrow. Then check for um, <coughs> you have tomorrow afternoon, two full days, and back on the fourth day, and the vehicle will meet you here again. Compass skills are essential in this wild country. If you look at a compass, you'll find that there's a housing on the top of it, which rotates. And underneath, on the bottom of it, that housing, there are some, some lines with an arrow on the bottom of it. So what you've got is, if you want to travel, the direction of travel, in other words, the direction you want to go in, should always be at the arrow at the front of your compass. So you, This group of expeditioners was to find many strange creatures in and around the Babai River. We spent a day trekking, sometimes on the land and sometimes in the water.
one weird ego. At the end of a hard day, it was good to talk and share experiences and continue our management training. There were odd moments for our intrepid leader to relax as our daily wildlife count increased. Each morning our faithful elephants were ready to carry us further but only after they had been fed with some elephant biscuits. While some cast their nets on the river, Mark, our mad scientist, needed some help to measure his catch. It's four and a half metres, I think, isn't it? Just over? Yeah. Eight centimetres under four and a half metres. That's snapped event? Yeah. And then no, there's the total? No, no, no. no, 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 no. Total. no. OK. Um, uh, interestingly, it's not an Indian python, which is the one I expected to find up here. It's the Burmese subspecies, which I didn't expect to find up here. <laughs> And it can't be the Indian because of certain scales on the head. It's got um, superocular scales. This one far exceeds the, the size of Indian pythons. This is a Burmese python. It's well capable of killing and eating deer. Um, it's capable of easily killing a man. It could eat a small person with no problem at all. Pythons and boas are quite primitive. And... Um, they have the remains of vestigial legs, and you can see them here. Little claws, remains of hind limbs, and inside is a pel the remains of the pelvic girdle. So some snakes do actually have legs. See? It's a little claw. And the only use for them is the male strokes the female during mating. And it's supposed to be turned on. For anyone that's interested, this is how you sex a snake. Now, it depends how many scales it goes in. And I would think it's a big one like this, it's liable to be a female. And it's going in one, two, three, three and a bit subcordals on that side. So, try the other side. That's, if it's a male, it's, it's not going in very far at all. Three and a half subcordals. Now, if it was a male, I would have expected the whole probe to have gone into about there. So, this is a female. In fact, she might even be full of eggs. No one I get a bad back I'm working with you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> There's no answer to that. <laughs> I'm not putting it down my shoulders because it's going to kill me. Okay. How's it metering? As far as I'm aware, this is the first record of Russell's Viper from the Bardia. How does it kill? It's um, got large hinge front fangs, it strikes very rapidly and injects a very painful and unpleasant blood poison. And really, um, it is a nasty way to go a bike from uh, Russell's. Christ, yeah, you recognise this, don't you? Come on, Crite. There's three Crites in the pool. 
So this is the one that's responsible for all the deaths. And it can get to about a metre and a half, maybe even two metres. This one's a matter of months old. Hello, my boy. He is angry. Yeah. Yo. Totally black as Satan. Pissed off. There you oh. go. Oh. Yes. <laughs> he likes you. Hey, Rod, right, what do you think of that? Hey. I'll we'll pull him down and, go and try to get him to hood down here first. And then we'll lift you up. Very interested in Chris. <laughs> <laughs> we put silk stitches in and we're going to give it to the warden to take the stitches out in seven days and release it. The warden's not about, so nobody would. So now we've got to release it and we're going to put dissolvable catgut stitches in so that they will dissolve away because you can't leave the silk stitches in. This is the Russell's Viper, which is the main Viper, main most dangerous Viper in Nepal. What I'm going to do is show you the fangs to compare with the Cobra. Now, nah, bit of difference. They're so long that the snake had never shut its mouth. So they hinge back into the back of the mouth. And when the snake strikes, they come forward like sabres, and often they're the first thing that hits. In almost the same place as he came from. And he's gone and going home. Which is lovely and cool in there. Okay, take another. And another. Uh, I don't. <laughs> Bye bye, Dennis. <laughs> he says, Get me out of here, there's a bloody king cobra up here. <laughs> and they eat snakes. We were coming to the end of our time in Nepal and our parting with the elephants and the Nepalese friends we had made. Pachwas and everybody. Can I just thank them very much for having me in their camp? For me, working with the elephants had been a fulfilment of a childhood ambition. We set off for the last time with the elephants swimming across the Karnali River. For all of us, it had been an unforgettable experience and we would take with us souvenirs of the mind and spirit. Nepal is there to change you, not for you to change it. Lose yourself in its presence. Make your footprints with care and awareness of the precious balance around you. Namaste.